Hey everybody, welcome to the Gluten-Free Society Newsroom. This is Dr. Osborne, and today we're gonna to be diving into a topic that we get asked a lot about, and that is why gluten-free diets fail to work for some people. Now, the question comes in a lot to us, but in my practice, I also see people on a regular basis where they'll, they'll come in, they've already been gluten-free, and yet they're still struggling. They're still not getting better. So let's ask today the fundamental question, why traditional gluten-free diets just don't work. So let's dive in. So several research studies have actually shown that a gluten-free diet actually fails to get people better. In this particular study, I'll put that slide up on the screen for you. What you're looking at is almost half of the participants, 40 0.7 to 42.2% stated they had persistent celiac disease symptoms despite following a gluten-free diet. So that's one research study. So that's almost half of the people going on a gluten-free diet for a prolonged period of time still had persistent issues. Now, if we look at another research study, this one published out of the American Journal of Gastroenterology. What we found here was that 30% of patients with celiac disease following a gluten-free diet failed to exhibit recovery of intestinal damage. Now, this is after five years on the diet. Now, if you didn't know this, your GI tract is a very fast healer. It, it's turning over the cells in your intestine, your small intestine turn over about every two to seven days. So if you're on a diet for five years and you still have persistent issues, there's something wrong with that diet or there's something else that's going on. So again, this study confirms the prior study. Then we move on to additional research. And this is really the big one. You can see here the traditional gluten-free diet gets a big fat F, uh, F for failing, right? So in this study, only 8% of patients recovered from intestinal damage while following a traditional gluten-free diet. Now I keep using this term traditional gluten-free diet and we're gonna explain what that means here in just a minute, so stay with me. But you can see here, after a median of 16 months, 8% of patients had normalization of their GI tract, but 65% had remission, uh, meaning their symptoms improved, but they had persistent white blood cells cramming into their GI tract to fight something. So, so that, that term here that you're looking at is intraepithelial lymphocytosis, just means they had persistent white blood cells that were battling in their GI tract. And that battle creates inflammation, creates damage, creates the symptoms associated with that inflammation and damage. Okay, so let's next let's dive into a little bit about why. So you again, you heard me mention this term traditional gluten-free diet. And, and so let's talk about why traditional gluten-free diets fail. Now, first of all, they break the cardinal rule of nutrition. This is the fundamental rule of nutrition, very simply put, is one cannot achieve health or maintain health eating food that is not healthy. And so what happens with most people with a gluten sensitivity diagnosis or people that have a celiac diagnosis is they go to their doctor, they get the diagnosis, and then they leave that doctor's office with either a, a pamphlet or a gift basket. The pamphlet has all these different highly processed gluten-free food item suggestions the gift basket's full of junk food that claims to be gluten-free. And so again, it breaks the cardinal rule. You can't restore health from years of damage by eating food that's low in vitamins and minerals, and it creates a, a sense of, of uh, inflammation in and of itself. Additionally, these highly processed foods are not healthy, regardless of whether the label claims to be gluten-free. So just because something is gluten-free doesn't mean it's good for you. And again, cardinal rule number one, which is you can't get healthy eating food that's not. This second component, which is if you're gravitating to, all, to that gluten-free food aisle in the grocery store, you're picking up tons of processed garbage. It's not gonna do you any favors. Number three, eating unhealthy foods leads to poor health. I think I've said enough there uh, without being redundant, I'll move on. Many over-the-counter packaged foods are cross-contaminated with gluten. So even if you go into the grocery store, pick up something that says that it's gluten-free, there was a pilot study published a few years ago that showed that over 40% of these products labeled as gluten-free actually had enough gluten cross-contamination to create a problem for those with celiac disease. So how much does it take to create that inflammation? Well, it takes about 20 parts per million, which is about the size of a breadcrumb. That's how much gluten exposure, cross-contamination it can take 
to create an inflammatory response. And some research shows that inflammation can last for up to two months. So if you're buying a lot of processed food and it's cross-contaminated with gluten and it's part of your consistent diet, this may be one of the reasons why we see these patients not healing in these long trials on, on gluten-free diets. Additionally, many gluten-free products contain other types of grain-based glutens that have not been adequately studied to be safe for those with gluten sensitivity. So what does that mean? So in 19, or I should say in, in, in 2013, the FDA in the United States created a new labeling law around what is and what is not gluten. So prior to that, there was no labeling laws around gluten. So again, this just goes back a few years. But the way they created this new labeling law was they, they said anything that has wheat, barley, or rye, we're going to call that gluten. And any of the other grains, we're going to call gluten-free. So for example, corn is gluten-free, rice, oats, sorghum, millet. These all get to be in a product, but get to be called gluten-free, even though technically none of these grains are gluten-free. There are lots of different types of, of glutens, and you have to also remember that. I, I, um, I have a comprehensive video that breaks that down. If you'd like to watch that, I'll put a link underneath this new segment for you to, to go and watch that. But um, understand that all grains contain some form of gluten. The gluten food labeling laws only really refer to one type of gluten. That gluten is called alpha gliadin. So that's the, the gluten that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. So a lot of your products contain these substitute grains that contain different forms of gluten. And I'll show you in just a minute some of the research that is pretty alarming on that topic. And then in addition, many processed foods contain additives, dyes, preservatives, GMO or genetically modified organisms, ingredients like uh, pesticides, hydrogenated fats, heavy metals, and large amounts of sugar. All those things, again, you can't establish health eating those things as staples in your diet. So let's dive in again a little bit to some of that research. So I mentioned a minute ago, there's more than one type of gluten. There's more than the, the gluten that alpha gluten found in wheat, barley, and rice. So here's what your doctor never told you about corn. So, so you can see here the quote, maize prolamines had low but definite activity, even though maize is reported to be harmless. Well, maize is corn. It's actually corn gluten. That's what prolamine is. It, prolamine is a, is a form of gluten. So when you see maize prolamines, what we're really saying is corn gluten. So again, in this research study published 1983, so this is not new research, folks. 1983, what we're seeing is that corn was creating an inflammatory response in people with gluten sensitivity, even though it's reported to be harmless. Now, that should alarm you. If this is the first time you're hearing that, and this study came out in 1983, that should be very alarming to you, especially if you've been eating a lot of corn-based products. But that's not all. Check out this next study. This, um, this particular study, you can see here, it's of interest that patients with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet had a lower incidence of wheat, but not of maize antibodies. Again, maize being corn, when compared with those patients not on a diet. So this study was actually done on patients with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and celiac disease. And what they found was higher levels of corn antibodies or corn reactivity in these individuals. Now, this next study, interestingly enough, now you, you heard me mention a minute ago, a lot of the gluten-free food items contain chemicals and additives and preservatives. Well, so this study is based on that. What you see here is MTG treatment, increased reactivity to wheat and maize prolamines, again, wheat and corn gluten in patients with celiac disease. What is MTG? MTG stands for microbial transglutaminase. Let's simplify it. MTG is meat glue. It's a substance used in the food packing and in the, um, in the food industry because it adds palatability to food. It makes food to have more of a gluten-like texture. Uh, and so it's used in a lot of processed gluten-free foods as a food additive to, again, to improve palatability. But what research is showing is that this, these meat glues actually cause people with gluten sensitivity issues to react even more aggressively to wheat and corn in this particular study. So we also see the same thing with dairy. And so some people going gluten-free haven't been told that, you know, cutting dairy out might be a good idea for them. Uh, this is one of the reasons why if you do any research on the internet, you'll come across the term GFCF. That stands for gluten-free, casein-free. It's a, it's a type of diet, right? So when gluten-free diets aren't enough, many people also go dairy-free. 
So what this research shows is that serum antibodies or IgA antibodies response of patients with celiac disease to bovine milk, meaning to cow's milk, could be related to gluten and casein sharing epitopes recognized by anti-gluten IgA antibodies. So let's, let's define what that really means. What that basically is saying is that the protein in milk is so similar to gluten that many people with celiac disease react to the milk proteins as well, hence the gluten-free, casein-free diet. So again, if, you, if this is the first time you're ever hearing this, and uh, you, know, you should be taking action on it, especially if you're still struggling. Okay. So one of the other things I want to dive into or talk about is that many people with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease are very misinformed. As you've already heard just from what I presented today, you know, corn has a form of gluten. The research shows that many people with celiac disease react to that form of gluten. Dairy has a protein that can look like gluten. So again, many of you who have a gluten sensitivity diagnosis or have a, have a celiac diagnosis were probably never told that. Your GI doctor probably never sat down and had this conversation with you. And as a matter of fact, again, Many of you walk out of your doctor's office with this laundry list of processed gluten-free food alternatives that contain tons of dairy, tons of corn and rice and other, you know, again, other processed preservatives and junk food, and that's not going to do anything for your health. So if you've gone on a traditional gluten-free diet, it's common to feel better while simultaneously developing additional health issues. So this is another common thing that people don't get told by their GI doctor. Many people go gluten-free and they feel better. Their guts feel better, but they still go on to have persistent problems. Now, in addition to that, many people never even get celiac disease. They have a gluten sensitivity. They have what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and they develop other medical conditions or other, um, we'll just say other autoimmune diseases. So let me show you this diagram. We'll pull this up for you. This was published in the journal Food Science and Human Wellness. And so what it basically, what we're looking at here that you can see on the left-hand side of this diagram, you can see the traditional symptoms of gluten exposure in the GI tract, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, distended abdomen, and failure to thrive if you're a baby, failure to thrive, in essence, you're not growing. Those are kind of the hallmark classic signs of gluten sensitivity as it relates to celiac disease. But if you look to the right of this diagram, again, conversation you probably never had with your GI doctor, maybe you did, maybe you had a really great talk, but, um, most of you, in my experience, haven't had this conversation, but look at all the different manifestations that gluten can have. So if we just go by, box by box, that top box, neurological and psychiatric manifestations of gluten exposure. Look, look next door to that. You can see epilepsy, seizure disorders, peripheral neuropathy, inflammatory myopathy, that means muscle disorder, myelopathies, gluten encephalopathy, so swollen brain, cerebellar ataxia, which causes dizziness and loss of balance, and even schizophrenia. So again, these are all neurological or psychiatric manifestations of gluten exposure that have nothing to do with symptoms in the GI tract. Then we go down and we see oral or, muco or mucocutaneous and facial manifestations. So again, the mouth and the face, we can see uh, children's particularly, if you've got children that have had a lot of cavities, one of the things gluten can cause is de dental defects. It can cause enamel defects on the teeth. There have been a number of research studies showing enamel defects in people with gluten sensitivity, uh, which can, again, lead to cavity formation. There's another autoimmune condition called Sjogren's syndrome, and this causes dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, because it's an autoimmune attack against your tear ducts and your salivary-producing glands in your mouth. Um, and so it's, it's very common, again, to see those as manifestations of gluten in the absence of celiac disease. Then we have skin manifestations. And if you haven't checked out my, my crash course on gluten and skin, make sure you check that out in my video archive in my library. But vitiligo, psoriasis, alopecia areata, which is, hair, which is less of a skin disease, more of a hair disease. But then you've also got diseases like psoriatic, psoriatic skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema, which are also, again, skin manifestations of gluten exposure. Then we have the blood-based or hematological manifestations. So most commonly, this is anemia. So we see low platelets in people. We see um, low red blood cells. We can see low white blood cells in individuals. Um, and then lymphoma is another disease. It's a, it's a cancer, actually, of the, you can get lymphoma in your intestine, and that's, 
again, it's a terminal cancer, and that can be a manifestation of gluten sensitivity in the absence of celiac disease. And then we get hepatic manifestations. So in essence, liver damage. And so there's biliary cirrhosis, so, so gallbladder damage, and there's autoimmune hepatitis, so our fatty liver disease or cirrhotic liver. So those are conditions that we know, again, gluten can damage the liver and gallbladder. So it's important that you understand because many people go gluten-free in the traditional sense, meaning they cut out wheat, barley, and rye, and their stomachs and their guts feel better, but they also have liver damage or Sjogren's disease or skin autoimmune disease or some other manifestation of gluten, some other neurological manifestation of gluten, and their doctor, because they never had this conversation about how gluten can affect the body in different ways, they go on through their gluten-free diet, continuing to struggle because why? Because they're not 100% gluten-free. They're actually, they're, this is what I meant earlier by traditional gluten-free. They're wheat, barley, rye-free, but they're still eating oats. They're still eating corn and rice and other grains. And they're still getting inflammatory damage induced by these other compounds or things like milk, again, that can mimic gluten or food additives like meat glue that can contribute to uh, altering the proteins, making them look more like gluten. So again, the, the manifestation of going gluten-free and not getting better, to answer your question, why does this happen? It's because you don't do it right. And so the right way to do it is what I call a true gluten-free diet, which is really technically going grain-free, but also understanding that pesticides, preservatives, food dyes, antibiotics in the food, and all the other chemicals that are found in the food, there's a number of research studies that show that these chemicals can actually exacerbate an existing gluten sensitivity. So you've got to be real careful with your diet if you really truly want to overcome not just celiac disease, but other forms of autoimmune conditions that are known to be related to gluten exposure. So that's the breakdown for you. That's why the gluten-free diet doesn't work. So if you really want it to work, you've got to go true gluten-free. If you want to get more information about what that really means, you want to do a deep dive into the research, check out my best-selling book. Uh, you can pick it up at Barnes & Noble. You can pick it up on Amazon. It's called No Grain, No Pain, published by Simon & Schuster Touchstone. And you can read a lot more about the true gluten-free diet and how to recover from chronic gluten-related illnesses. This is Dr. Osborne with Gluten-Free Society wishing you excellent health. Have a great day.